Hello, listeners. Welcome to the 80th episode of The Goods, a film podcast. We got ourselves a treat this week because we have another guest appearance, and it's a repeat appearance. It's our pal Gargus. How are we doing, Gargus? I am doing perfectly peachy keen. I'm glad to hear it. And Brian, as always, every week, it's a pleasure. How are you doing, Brian? Yeah, glad to be here once again on the big 8-0 yeah. We've got a, a weird one to discuss here tonight. You know, I'm always a fan of those. Yeah. We love us a good, strange film. Brian, you did some drone filming this weekend. That's right. Went down to the Williamsburg area and I was helping out getting footage for a documentary on farming. So we had some nice big fields to explore. And I think I got a lot of good footage. And, you know, toot my own horn there, but. Uh, it's something I have been branching into, and so if you need drone services for your realty video or you're inspecting a roof, give me a call. The Goods Film Podcast at gmail dot com for your podcasting needs as well as your drone footage needs. Gargus, you uh, brought to us last time Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which was unusual in its own right, a, a musical. I think this week takes the cake though on ter in terms of uh strangeness so you pitched me this movie as neko z alenki i don't know how you actually pronounce that i i googled it and realized in the u.s they typically just label it as alice yes it's a 1988 film although i prefer to go with the original Zek title which i think is something more like i i don't know how to speak Zek, but just going by having watched the film in Czech this time, Neko Zielenke, with a bit of an E sound at the end instead of an E. Okay. It translates out to something like Alice, which I think is a far more appropriate title for this adaptation, given its radical reworking of the original material. Yeah. Well, I think it's worth saying that uh, n none of us speak Czech. I don't, I don't think. And it strikes me as is something of a difficult language at least when it comes to pronunciation so uh take any czech name or word we attempt with a grain of salt yeah because we're not authorities well fortunately there's only about one character in the entire film who has a czech name and it's one that readily translates back into english so that's helpful we can just say alice right but we uh we do have a director i say jan Svank major uh, what have you guys settled on? I was actually looking this up earlier. I listened to a few things from him just to make sure I had it. I believe it's Jan Svankmeyer. Okay. All right. I can live with that. My guess was Jan Svankmeyer. So I think we all got pretty close. Yes. So had the two of you seen any Svankmeyer films before? Uh, yes, this was the first one of his that I discovered. I actually found it through the uh, same source that I found Hedwig. It was the website 366 Weird Movies, which is one of my favorite sites. They used to have a thing going where they were trying to find a definitive canon of the 366 weirdest movies, one for each day of the leap year. And now that they've done that, they're continuing on their mission with an apocrypha list that's as a separate but equal sort of addition to the ones they already have. This site rules, Brian. Have you ever been to this site? I haven't, and clearly I'm missing out. Yeah. Well, yes, they have, they have all sorts of wonderful things. I mean, even the stuff that they outright reject for the list, a lot of the time it's interesting to look into. That's really cool. I'll say that where I first encountered Svankmare was the Facebook group ISF, Incredibly Strange Films. And I, uh, I hadn't seen this one yet, but I've watched several of his stop motion shorts that often use clay. And yeah, definitely some weird, upsetting stuff. Yeah, I've seen a few of his shorts. The two most notable ones to me are Dimensions of Dialogue, which was one of his first films of the 80s after he spent the, most of the 70s being censured by his government. So, um, it's three related shorts about 
types of dialogue showing heads made out of different materials eating each other and spinning them up in various it's um torn down and chewed up pieces until eventually they're all the same material of clay just chewing each other up and spinning them out again and again and again or like two clay heads with various materials coming out of their mouths like one brings out a pencil the other brings out a pencil sharpener one brings out a tube of toothpaste the other brings out a toothbrush and they run through all those until they've exhausted all the regular possibilities and then they start mashing them up in non-productive ones that wind up destroying the various objects until they've exhausted all possibilities and they're just cracked and exhausted which gives you some idea of the way that Svankmaier tends to make his films. Okay, so it sounds like Svankmaier has, like, head issues going on because there's lots of head stuff in Alice as well. Oh, yes, there's also one in his Darkness Light Darkness short. I I was just about to say that, that was, that's the one that I'm familiar with, is Darkness Light Darkness where uh, it starts out where you've got this little tiny like shoebox room and there's a clay head in there and the lights keep turning on and off and gradually more body parts like crawl into the little room and they all start assembling themselves into a body that's like too big for this little room and it's just all cramped in there. Really striking. Yeah, Svankmaier does tend to have a lot of disturbing imagery and especially disturbing audio design because one of the major components I've noticed of his work is he tends to make the very small, almost inaudible things of everyday activities right there in the forefront of the soundscape. But I think Darkness Light Darkness also illustrates that he does have a sense of humor. I'm sp thinking specifically of the part where the body parts that are already assembled are all of a sudden huddled up in fear because there's something massive pounding on the outside of the house and they can't tell what it is and it's shaking the foundations and then it ceases and they open the door and it's this tiny little penis that just kind of limply crawls in. That's pretty funny. I, I need to see some more of this guy. I, I recommend absolutely everything he's ever done. So I had never heard of this guy, at least to my recollection, prior to this week. I did a little bit of research since Gargas selected this film for us and seems like pretty well-regarded stop motion kind of auteur did a lot of well-regarded works. This seems to be his most popular. And also his debut feature after about, about 25 years working in the industry, plus or minus not being allowed to do much in the 70s. Interesting. Is is he still alive? I didn't look that up. I probably, I probably should have started with that. He's still alive, although he's getting into his like late eighties. So okay, I believe he had his what he intended as his final film, Insects, premiere back in twenty eighteen. Oh wow. Okay. Yes, he hasn't done that much in terms of features compared to his dozens upon dozens of short films, but. I also recommend his adaptation of Faust, his adaptation of uh, Little Autic, and his original work, Conspirators of Pleasure, which I think may be his best work, even if it's not my favorite. Otherwise, I would have brought that one on instead. Gotcha. I, I wonder if Jan Svankmer has ever met Jonas Mikas. <laughs> That's what I want to know. I think they're... Well, I guess, uh, I guess Jonas Mikas isn't alive anymore, right? But he... There was a period of time where they could have met. He was Lithuanian, not Czech. That Jonas Mikis is the avant-garde filmmaker who made, uh, as I was moving ahead, occasionally I saw brief glimpses of beauty, which Brian and I disagreed on the quality of quite a bit. Yeah, we had some differing opinions, but... You know, I've wanted to see that movie for ages, but I've never been able to track it down. But let's just say that I would recommend it and Brian would not. Yeah, but we could hook you up. And as far as offbeat Eastern European filmmakers, he, he's our touchstone so far. I know the one who is the most direct of an influence on Svank Mir is uh, Jerry Turnka, who was another stop motion animator who worked from the 40s to the 50s and the hmm. 60s. I'm not familiar with him. Sounds like I got my, my work ahead of me for like getting up on this really interesting stop motion stuff from the, yeah, from Europe. Yeah, I've seen his film Prince Bayaya before from 1950, which I I don't recall what I thought of it, but 
it's it's difficult to recall what exactly one thinks of every single film one's ever seen, especially when one watches so many. Right. Yeah, that's why you got to record it. I know he made a very well regarded puppetry adaptation of A Midsummer Night's Dream in the late fifties. Hmm. Interesting. Brian, did I just hear you advocating for logging your your viewing? I just said record what you think about movies. Okay. Which is what we are already doing. Oh, I, I, <laughs> well, I do. It's just that, you know, I got to go and like look it up and read it and try and remember what headspace I was in when I wrote it and internalize it all again. There's only so much space in the old noggin for active information. Brian and I, I don't know how much of this has actually made it onto the pod as opposed to our ongoing messenger chats, but uh, we also disagree on the value of fastidiously cataloging one's own movie viewing which i do now and brian is not an advocate for these days i I just don't care to have such a list i i i don't need a list like that and certainly no one else needs a list of my viewing habits that's entirely fair i'm just an obsessive i i think if i enjoy a film enough it will stick with me without having to keep a list like that yeah I mean, my, my my position on it is that you're probably right on that. I just enjoy having a little record of what I was thinking and, you know, keeps me busy. I like doing it. Sure. It's, yeah, it's like a diary. Nothing wrong with that. Yep. Yeah. Different strokes, different folks. So this film by, by Jan Svankmeyer is, I'm going to say it wrong every single time and that's okay. <laughs> it's translated, well... The, in English, it's titled Alice, and it is indeed a adaptation of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. So it is a very commonly adapted work, and I think a very influential work. So I actually just, I, I wanted to know more about it. So I actually read it today, and I'd never read it before. So it's, it's on my mind. What Gargus, what do you what's your take on Alice in Wonderland? Do you have like a, a, a centralized take on this piece of literature? I think my take would be that a big reason why I like Alice and why it has endured so long in the popular culture is because even though it's a work of very specific, you know, mid-19th century English deliberate nonsense. There is a quality about Lewis Carroll's wordplay and the imagery that he conjured that makes it incredibly malleable. You you will always wind up with something that is very much like Alice when you adapt it, but it's possible to take it so terribly far from what it initially started as and any of the interpretations that are popular about the book itself, whether you're talking about it as, say, just, you know, oh, a simple... Oh, nonsense fairy story for children or an absurdist look at the rise of concepts like imaginary numbers and mathematics at the time or you know the ever popular oh lewis carroll was just you know writing about drugs when he did this you can take it so far away from anything that applies to the book and only have a few little points of reference left and it's still both recognizable about as itself and very telling in what you have chosen to do to the work in order to make it all your own even if you twist it as radically as something like this does it's an interesting quality something being so specific but so easily malleable right because i mean clearly it's resonated with generation after generation um i mean there's no uh shortage ever of fresh takes on on alice illustrations adaptations uh plays drama ballets it's just always popping up it's it's clearly endured yeah i especially remember when i was in middle school i read you know an adaptation that was like one of those popular oh here's a um here's an old work of a fairy tale or english literature and we've made it uh we've made it game of thrones for children Something like the Looking Glass Wars, I think it was called. Oh, interesting. Yeah, like they, they people pull ideas and images from it as well as actually straight up adapting it. I mean, like for example, the the Matrix has some Alice stuff going on with the White Rabbit, and I think there's a couple other things there. I just feel like it ideas from it, the the notion of the White Rabbit and through the Looking Glass and stuff like that just appears all over the place. 
and the Cheshire Cat and the Caterpillar and the Mad Hatter and the March Hare. Right. And even stuff from its own sequel winds up slipping in so often, although I'd argue that Tweedledee and Tweedledum slip into it most often, even to get confused as something from the first book entirely because of the Disney adaptation. Mm, yeah. A couple things. Well, one is I'm surprised you, you're only reading it for the first time, but uh, I, I have read the original book and Through the Looking Glass. I've been thinking recently, like with the rise of Disney+, Plus, what were Disney films that I watched the most as a kid? And one of them was definitely the 1951 Alice. Interesting to me that a story that's so episodic and kind of random and then ends with the and it was all a dream ending still has such power to stick with you. Like these are visuals that are kind of in everybody's subconscious with the Cheshire Cat and and Tweedledee and Tweedledum and yeah. just all the bits even though it's it's just kind of bouncing from one thing to the next. But yeah, you can't downplay its significance and i do believe a big part of why the work is so malleable is because it is itself about an incredibly malleable place that results in alice's own identity being a little bit scrambled up like it's not just the constant changing of size and people getting her name wrong there's plenty of points in the actual narration and dialogue where alice is mildly questioning oh am i who i think i am and then she does the things like where she tries to do her recitations and it comes out all garbled nonsense. Right. But you can twist it up like taffy, but that taffy twisting is sort of baked into the very concept and way that the narrative plays out. And you're right. It's more than just the imagery. It's like the aspect of identity is kind of a big piece of it too. Like knowing oneself and, and all that. It's a very strange and specific set of imagery, but because it is attached to something so general as a sense of identity and a work that is you know very much for children but also has these elements that are a little bit more i suppose adult would be the right term lacking in the better one right. but either way it's it's working with broad universal themes and isn't 100 percent clear how or why it's doing that which i think leaves it open to people taking it and claiming it as their own again and again and again, even 150 years later. I think that's probably a big part of its enduring popularity. What you just said is that it avoids very easy thematic explanation because there is just so much going on with it that it doesn't really neatly tie together. Like you can't strictly say it's just a Victorian era satire. It's just a parable about coming of age. It's just a hallucination from the hookah. It's like it, it can it can withstand all sorts of different readings because it just doesn't really have one thread that ties it all together. Yep. So I've actually never quite clicked with Alice's Adventures in Wonderland as a story. And I think maybe it's because I didn't actually get all that exposed to it that much when I was a kid. I did watch the Disney one a couple of times, but to me, it just seems like that, that aspect of everything being so episodic and not really tying together and not having a clear thematic purpose. I mean, it seems like it, it just feels like silly, random nonsense. And I know like there, there's an element of pride of saying it's in the nonsense genre. Like I, I know, I think that's, intentional but for me it just feels so like out of control like there's nothing for me to latch on to and i can see why it was like a crazy influential book like i can just imagine how much this must have been like a lightning bolt to children's literature in like the super uptight victorian area era where everything was just like reciting your verses and following the rules and here was like this super silly out of nowhere just utter chaos anarchy of a novel that all the kids read are like, Oh, this is amazing. And I can see why it like would have been influential at the time. But for me, it doesn't have enough there that like, this is something that I personally would want to keep revisiting, but clearly I'm in the minority on that. I don't know. Yeah, children and adult literature, because even though this is drawing off through the looking glass instead of the original book, I believe the uh, poem Jabberwocky, which Carol introduced in that book was 
meant as not just a fun little piece of nonsense poetry, but also specifically a reaction against the sheer rigidity of the poetic form in the English language in Victorian society at the time. So I've meant to point out, you know, you can you can make up you know, all these sorts of weird nonsense words and structure them in such a strange way, and it still works. It's all arbitrary. Mm, interesting, yeah. You know, twas billig and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the boar groves and the moan rafts out grey. That, that scans, but you look specifically at it and it's nonsense. Right, yeah. So who's to say that any other word is just like, we only agree that they scan because we all use them all the time. So as part of my reading of the book, I did a medium deep dive on Lewis Carroll himself. Mm -hmm. And he is fascinating in part because so much of his life and his perspective has been kind of censored from the world. He wrote like a bunch of diaries and letters and his family burned bunches and bunches of them. So people don't really know exactly what he was like. There's there's some basic facts that everyone agrees on, including some important ones, but like lots of things have kind of devolved into like uh, legend almost. So he, he's studying to be a priest and he kind of wrote this story for Alice Lindell, I think is the name. And she was the daughter, I think of the, one of like the heads of the school, the, the, the college that he was studying at. And at some point, and this is like one of the areas of the diaries that have been kind of destroyed, uh, he had a falling out with that family. So the most popular legend is that basically he was in love with Alice, who was like 11 at the time, and that there's like lots of pedophilic like imagery and obsessions kind of built into his psyche if not his work itself um and that he like proposed that he would marry alice or something and that was what caused the falling out but there's no evidence to back that up apparently it's just like a, a legend there's like hints in his letters that he had a relationship with a woman or a girl named ina which could have been like alice's older sister or maybe even alice's mom which would have caused the falling out or maybe it was just someone totally different and because there was some scandal, the uh, the family disowned him. And there was also a weird thing where he got like a, an unusual exemption from becoming a priest. So he never actually took the the black or whatever it is. Took What do you say when you become the priest? Took the frock? Becoming a member of the cloth? I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, he becoming a member of the cloth. That's what it is. Take the cloth. So he basically spent his whole life kind of as a... a a teacher and he did lectures and stuff, but he never actually became a priest, which was very unusual for people who actually went to college and graduated in a divinity school. And so people are like, why did he do that? It was there some controversy about him or some power that he held over someone else. So uh, I don't know. Um, a lot of mystery in his life and it's probably not all that interesting, whatever it is. I mean, it's probably less interesting than people's imagination, but a, clearly a really smart and clever dude who like had tons of knowledge and imagination in his head and was able to tie it all together. Yeah. The read that Lewis Carroll was a pedophile has never really sat right with me, mostly because a lot of the time when it's advanced, it doesn't seem to be on the basis of anything that's compelling or definitive in, in the archive of his work. It's more just like, people wanting to put a salacious or controversial spin on things. And to be certain, there are things, activities that he engaged in that would not at all fly in the modern day, like his ha habit of, not a habit, it was actually a side business he ran of doing um, child photography for friends and neighbors, and it did often involve them in a state of undress, but... Yeah, that was mentioned in the, the articles I read, and there's a lot of disagreement on whether that was actually weird or whether that was, like, not weird in the era. And a socially acceptable thing at the time. Right. Yeah. Good reminder that even though the story itself has endured over the last century and a half, a lot of other stuff from that time, the information and our ability to recall or archive it decay, decay stupid fast. Right. 
Yeah, it's always interesting what what stands the test of time. One other little thing on Lewis Carroll is he invented a word puzzle that some people still do today called either the word ladder or the ladder gram, where you basically have a, a word at the top and a word at the bottom and some number of steps between them. And the the rules of the game are basically you can change one letter of the word at the top at a time, and it always needs to be a real word. And you need to get to the bottom word. So the example I saw, the one that was on Wikipedia, is if you have the word head on top and tail on bottom, you could go head, heel, teal, tell, tall, tail. And so like you would transform the words that way. So anyways, I thought it was kind of interesting that he like this was clearly a dude who had a lot going on in the noggin. Didn't know he did that. It's pretty interesting. Anyways, that was I was thinking a lot about that because part of my reaction here was some of it was my own hangups with the Alice story. So that was kind of on my mind as we were going. But I think I'm ready to hop into the movie itself. Any other preliminary thoughts on Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll, Jans Fjankmeyer, anything before we hop in, Brian or Gargus? Uh, I just wanted to say that one this is interestingly not the only Alice adaptation that uh, 366 inducted into their official canon of weird movies. The uh, BBC Sunday play adaptation of it from 1966 also made it in. Oh man, there's one from like 1935 that should get a spot too. It was some weird prosthetics. Yeah, that one where they spent a whole slew of money on it and then it kind of turned out to freak people out and it wasn't that much at the box office. Is that the 30s one? Or is that a yes, the 1933 one? one from Norman Z. McLeod. That's wild. The guy who did a bunch of the uh, Marx Brothers movies. There you go. And then there's the, uh, the 1999 TV movie with Whoopi Goldberg as the Cheshire Cat. There's, there's lots of weird ones out there. There's uh, Dreamland, which was actually a, um investigation into the whole, you know, um, narrative investigation into another, you know, real-world investigation into the ag- allegations of Lewis Carroll's pedophilia starring Ian Holm with a bunch of uh, creature effects from the Jim Henson workshop. Well, wild. There's an 80s one that I think that Carol Channing's in that one. Man, that story's been everywhere. There's, of course, the garishly ugly Johnny Depp one from yeah. the late 2000s, early 2010s or whatever. I just think it's kind of funny that for like 20 years prior to Tim Burton doing his own adaptation of Alice, there were all sorts of adaptations that came out where the public reaction was, oh, this is like if Tim Burton did an Alice adaptation, most specifically American McGee's Alice, the uh, third person shooter video game. Mm -hmm. And then Tim Burton went and did his own version of Alice, and it's kind of one of his most hated movies. Right. (laughs) I just find that amusing. But... Let's dive into to Alice, Nico Z. Alenke. Something like Alice. So this this story opens with Alice bored on like the side of a creek with her sister, tossing rocks into a stream. The sister, you don't see her face. She's reading a book. Alice said to herself. Yeah. And and uh, and all of a sudden, Alice starts narrating to herself, like inside her head. Alice thought to herself, now you will see a film made for children. Perhaps. But I nearly forgot. You must close your eyes. Otherwise, you won't see anything. Which is not from the book. I don't think any of that is from the, the source. Yes, that is original to this picture. And I think it's important to note right away that it, pretty much any and all instances of dialogue in this film are voiceover from the actress who plays Alice, whose name is... It's something like Christina Kahutova. Christina Kahutova, yeah. Except imagine that it's said by a Czech person. Yeah, yeah, but any and all instances of dialogue are voiced over from her, and after every single one, there is a close-up on her lips as she says, said Alice to herself, insisted the white rabbit, shouted the March Hare. Every instance of dialogue is accompanied by a sudden close-up on her mouth with her saying that, or something to that effect. 
I wanted to talk about this at some point, and since you brought it up now, it, this is very striking. So you have characters in a world, and whenever there is dialogue, it flashes over to that close up on her face. It like really jars the rhythm of the film. And it also makes it, like you said, so that we only ever hear a single person's voice. I had a couple of theories on this or thoughts on this, um, but w what's your take on this, Gargus? The way that I have always read this film is that it is, because it is Alice or something like Alice, it's Alice in a mode that is other than the traditional Victorian England expression of it. Like that sort, that sort of particular style drawn from either the John Tenniel illustrations of the original book or as you get further into the late 20th century the Disney version of it it's all very rooted in that particular sort of you know proper English manner that is then twisted up and made unrecognizable by all the nonsense of Wonderland this isn't that this is a child's reimagination or reinterpretation of Alice in a state that was at the time still behind the Soviet bloc. It's a place that's more defined by lack than the traditional picture of Victorian England. You know, we get into Alice's home very soon after this, and while it is cluttered with objects in some way, it's more just like various bits and bobs that have been kept as sentiment or kept around as necessity over the decades. And a lot of the house is very empty. It's dirty. It's gritty. There's a lot of sharp edges everywhere, you know, tacks and jagged pieces of metal just sort of laying around. And I, I, met, I bring this all up because the focus on Alice's mouth as a deliverer of who said what and how after every single line of dialogue sort of shows that this is a more interior wonderland, one that's made up of found materials from around the house and not really, you know, flesh and blood creatures like is usually portrayed, but, you know, dolls and, you know, homunculi of skeletons and various pieces of fabric from around the house and your know, taxidermy rabbit playing cards who are literally just cut out playing cards. It's all something that's coming from Alice interior to her based on what she knows. That's interesting. On the mouth specifically, I think my take was um, that, first of all, it just adds a, a kind of a rhythmic element to the form of the movie where like, I don't know, um, whenever Alice encounters a new creature who must express themselves, like it redirects us back towards Alice, which really makes this feel more dreamlike it feeling like this is happening in her head and like the arbitrary logic of a dream and almost like a nightmare, but not like a horrifying nightmare, you know, just like where nothing's quite right. Like everything's just kind of uncomfortable. But there is a lot to unpack there, as you're right. And one thing is that it does that every time there's dialogue, but there's not actually that much dialogue. It's it's a pretty visually defined film, not much in the way of speaking. Yeah, and when there is speaking, it kind of tends to be just a very small handful of lines. I think the caterpillar is the most verbose of the lot. And otherwise, you get into situations where either characters are essentially just repeating the same lines over and over whenever they recur, as with the right rabbit, or certain scenes just play out entirely without any dialogue whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Anything you wanted to throw in here, Brian? Well, I don't know when's the right time to say it, but I was repeatedly struck with, as weird as these interpretations are, I could never call this like an inaccurate adaptation of Alice in Wonderland. Like every tableau we get, every like bit, every scene is generally something taken from the book, but then just presented in a weird way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's already, it's already weird, but like, you still got the caterpillar scene. You still got, uh, you know, the trial by the Queen of Hearts and the croquet scene and even stuff that uh, sometimes you don't get in adaptations, like the scene with the uh, baby pig. 
And to exemplify that, do you mind if I take us into how we actually get into Wonderland? Sure. So the movie proper begins with Alice in a cluttered room in her house. The opening that we talked about with her being on the uh, bank of a riverbed with her sister is one of the very, very few times the movie actually goes to an exterior. And it's not actually where she enters Wonderland. When she does and she sees the white rabbit, she's alone in a room overcrowded with knickknacks. And the white rabbit is a taxidermy bunny who's sitting in a cage with a little uh, scientific name marker on the edge of it. And all of a sudden he comes to life, uses his teeth to chomp off the little metal poles that are holding him in place, tears open his abdomen, spilling out a bunch of sawdust and retrieving his pocket watch, which he licks the sawdust off and realizes, oh, I shall be so terribly late, said the white rabbit gets his clothes and rushes off out into a suddenly there open expanse of, it always struck me as being on the seaside, this big plain of jumbled up rocks that kind of make it impossible to run or walk on an even plain to reach a desk just sitting in the middle of nowhere and dives within. Yeah, it's... It's pretty out there. So yeah, Alice's rabbit hole in this is a an ordinary desk filled with uh, protractors and compasses. There's a lot of use of taxidermy for the stop motion in this film, and I man, my rating of this movie was like all over the place at different moments. <laughs> it's like on the on the one hand that like appeals to me because it's so weird. On the other hand, it's like. Man, he was touching this stuff for just <laughs> hours and hours and hours. It's like, and and some of it is 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 not even preserved. It's just hunks of meat, wet meat, and he was touching it. <laughs> hunks of meat and ink and weird goopy jam. Does that do you with tax in it? Do you find yourself appreciating his craft when he does this, Brian, or just weirded out by it? So it's, it's like it was. Like, at first strike, it's like, oh, man, he, he has a bunch of skulls. That's awesome. And then it's like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm seeing the other side of that now. <laughs> Let's talk through some of the the specific segments we get, and we can be kind of free form. We can, we can bounce around. So the, you talked about the opening house, which, like, transitions to the, the Rocky Plain thing. I think it's worth noting this house already kind of feels off. The proportions of things in this movie are never quite right, which to me is especially striking because when you think a stop motion movie, you kind of think everything is stop motion or like, I don't know, like it's like a toy box feel or something. But this is like things in a real sized set. You can tell it's like because there's a person there. But also things aren't the right size. And it's just very, and they're like not oriented in a comfortable way. And it's just from the start, very weird. Just like, it's just the feeling of it. It's not scary or even like viscerally disgusting. It's just kind of off-putting and unnerving the way that everything is arranged. Yeah. Like when she's going down through the rabbit hole and it's like a service elevator that's taking her along this this dark shaft with a whole bunch of, you know, items preserved in jars along it. You, you only got those stripes of light when she passes by an opening in the shaft. The whole thing where she, you know, reaches out and grabs things that are passing her as she goes. She, like, grabs a jar and breaks open its sort of crusty plastic coating. And like I said, it's this weird, nasty-looking jam or jelly that has all sorts of, you know, little tacks inside of it. What this scene made me think of, uh, kind of a weird uh, touch point, but in the Pee Wee's Playhouse Christmas special, there's a scene where he's he opens up a door and he's looking at his toy collection and it's just all these shelves scrolling by like on a never ending elevator. Mm, yeah. And I was like, oh, it's like it's just like that. It made me think of um, 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T with the elevator. I don't know why it made me think of that. Oh, yeah. I guess just because it's an elevator. Yeah, no, I can see that, too. I mean, every single movie would be improved by the elevator song from the 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. <laughs> Another thing, we 
just a recurring thing is there's many drawers. It's kind of a recurring image. And whenever there's a drawer, every single time she reaches in to grab the door drawer to open it and she pulls and the handle comes off in this very satisfying like plunk as it comes off. And I just I found that increasingly amusing as the movie went that it the drawer is always <laughs> broken the same way. That's a very dreamlike thing, I guess. Something I've always appreciated about the element with the uh, drawer knobs coming off is that at the start of the movie, whenever it happens, Alice is putting all her force into it and she's usually knocked back by the sudden release. And as the movie goes on, you know, she's a little more prepared for it each time until she's able to anticipate and have it come off in her hand without any sort of trouble. You know, appreciable little character advancement. Yeah, that that is true. That's I like that too. Um, another recurring thing is so we see at the the start that this is after its transition to her room that she's kind of recreated the scene from the creek that opened the movie where there's two dolls like ch- classic china dolls and she like throws little pebbles into a teacup the same way that she was throwing rocks into the water and one of these china dolls the smaller one is actually what she transforms into whenever she like eats something and has to shrink. She becomes the China doll that was her toy at the start. Yeah, there's lots of repetition. Images that recur over and over, like the dolls are dressed like her and her sister. And then, like you say, she becomes the doll. And the drawer just over and over and over again. And she like keeps having the same confrontation with the white rabbit, too. Sir, please... Yeah, the the caption said, please, sir, but what it sounded like she was saying to me, and I would bet dollars to donuts, is the actual English translation is she says, hey, bunny. Yeah, I noticed that too. That's what the check sounds like, and I'll bet that's just what she's saying. Yeah, I think you're right. I believe the subtitles on the version we watched were based on the uh, English dub. One variation on the doll that I liked in particular was one time... She grows big, and this is a time when it wasn't her choice for her to grow big. I forget exactly how it came about. If I can provide the context? Yeah. It's uh, after the scene where she's in the White Rabbit's house, and she has done the thing where the lizard, who in this version is a uh, lizard skull attached to a little doll body. She's big in the White Rabbit's house. The lizard comes down the chimney. She kicks it out. And in this version, it kind of looks like he dies because when he hits the ground, he just sort of leaks sawdust everywhere and his eyes roll over to white. Mm -hmm. Alice is trying to sneak out because she's because the rocks that they were throwing at her have turned into cakes because it's Wonderland. Of course. And instead of being able to get away scot-free in this version, it turns into a original scene for this and take on the story where the white rabbit and the animals start chasing her. And they all back her up against a, um, I believe it's a pail with some sort of liquid in it and a little uh, wooden plank leading up to it. She backs up up in order to get away from them. A uh, flying skeleton creature causes her to tip over to it. And like you were saying. Yeah, so she she turns into, she she's the doll, but then she goes back into human size but she doesn't leave her doll trappings. So she's like literally encased inside the shell of a doll, which she has to like puncture through and come out. And I'm thinking that some psychologist was like, has a lot of notes to be taken on this scene. Cause I, I just felt like there was some weird psychosexual stuff going on with some of this. Yeah. It was really weird. She, the whole thing. I mean, you could say that of any moment in this movie, but she like tears out of the doll cocoon and then it's just this doll husk that's left lying there. Right. Yeah. And it should be noted that she doesn't get out of the doll until all the animals like tie a rope around her and drag her back upstairs and just sort of leave her in a service closet. The, the scene that leads to this with the, it's like this battle between these skeleton, these animal skeletons that look very much like real animal skeletons had me actually thinking of you, Brian, because you have a skeleton of a cat in your house that I don't know, whenever I see like just full complete animal skeletons, I always think of that. And I I don't know. What was your reaction to this skelly battle, Brian? Oh, it was a visceral reaction. Yes. Because 
true, true enough, in pride of place in my home is a full cat skeleton that my brother got me for Christmas. And uh, it was a good surprise. He, apparently he saw it at a yard sale somewhere and uh, got the got the cash together to get this thing to surprise me with. He knew it, it needed to be here. He knew you were the man for it, yeah. And uh, And that's why I say I had such mixed feelings, because honestly, I do have an appreciation for taxidermy. I think it's cool that they can preserve... Uh, animals that way when you think of organic material being so fleeting normally but uh man th th there's so many and he mixes and matches them all it's he's like he's like sid in toy story but instead of toy parts it's all the bones <laughs> yeah there's like a fish that has like regular human legs strapped up to its front and they've all got like little glass eyeballs set into their sockets yeah they have these cartoony googly eyes that just make it all the more ghoulish to me yeah like you think it would count you think it would counteract it and make it less morbid but it's almost more or like little uh human skull with the big old floppy jester hat that kind of drags itself around on its arms oh uh, yeah it's like there's like a little monkey with the clown stuff yeah and, but the what really got me is there's this chariot or a like a stagecoach thing that uh, somebody rides around in and it's pulled by these creatures that are like pigeons with little uh, rabbit or ferret skulls and but they make horse sounds <laughs> <laughs> and really just what a crazy juxtaposition yeah that you're seeing those two animals put together that are making a third animal sound and it it's never not jarring and then, yeah, so you get used to seeing all these all these different, like, whip-stitch homunculi, but then they all charge Alice all at once, and they're, like, crawling all over, and uh, it was something, like, in the moment I wasn't even thinking of is, like, wow, what a accomplishment that these things are moving in stop motion, but then you have the real human there, and, I mean, it looks like it's really happening, and it, so she must have been, like, sitting there for a long time. Yeah. I also love that even though the scene after this is completely original to this film, the amount of emphasis that he puts on these skeleton creatures already sort of gives them more prominence than they have in the book because any instances with them, it's all happening while Alice is stuck inside the White Rabbit's house and only Bill the Lizard gets any sort of prominence and his only thing is to get kicked right up the chimney again. Oh, there goes Bill, as they say in the Disney version. There goes Bill. <laughs> I think my favorite individual scene in the movie, the one that just really captured my imagination, I think is supposed to be the caterpillar scene. She walks into this room and there's on the ground all of these socks, very phallic socks, I'll say, like chewing through the floor like, uh, I don't know, like maggots eating through some organic material or like a leaf or something. Just like yeah, going in and out of the holes. Yeah. And like p puncturing new ones. And then there's like one chief sock slash caterpillar that is gets its teeth and the googly eyes that, that Brian was talking about. Or maybe they're more like glass eyeballs or something. It like swallows a pair of dentures and then it talks with them. Yeah, and its mushroom is actually made out of, I think, like a little wooden doorknob. And this was the moment that really stuck out to me where I realized I couldn't point to any moment of it and say, that's wrong. That's not Alice. It's like, it all is. It's This is the scene from the book. And yet through this bizarre lens. Because it really is. It's such an unusual tone. It's like. I don't know what the right word is for it because it's again it surrealist I, I guess surrealist but there's also like it never goes like into full lynchian emotional intensity like there's always a clinical detachment to it even as it's going it's just like she's kind of pointedly observing that oh there's weirdo socks going around at my feet and oh now my own socks are trying to join their fleet and <laughs> yeah I don't know which is very much in keeping with some of the tone that Carol uses in his original work. I agree with that for sure, yeah. Alice is nothing if not a very stout-hearted and steady heroine. Right. Even if she can get a little bit frustrated. 
definitely devoid of whimsy and like the silliness is like a almost disgusting visual play. I think it should be noted also that when the caterpillar has finished with its scene, it goes to sleep by engulfing the mushroom it was sitting upon and grabbing a thread and a needle and sewing its own eyes closed. And then Alice tries to leave the room and her own socks try to run off to join the fleet of tube socks that are shuffling through the floor. So after this caterpillar scene, we get this visual thing that just really struck me and I I couldn't place exactly what this was from the book. I, maybe it was from the second one because I only read the first one. But it's like this frog hopping around catching flies. And this frog has the most disgusting tongue of any creature that has ever existed. Oh yeah, the fish foot. Is it a fish? The fish footman and the frog footman. They are from the book. Okay, gotcha. But... Yeah, this is like this is also around the time when we get the living meat that Brian was talking about. Just for like four minutes, this movie is like an overdrive on the here are flabs of flesh hopping around. Yeah, man, I I mean, I just have the barest inkling of how long stop motion takes and to have a raw piece of meat lying out that long makes my skin crawl as I think it's supposed to. (laughs) <laughs> yeah although in fairness i do think the footmen are clay especially since like there is a part where since alice is slightly out of scale with them they they do the thing from the book where they bow to one another and their wigs get entangled but in this it's not so much just like regular entangling the wigs come to life and start fighting each other and Alice goes over to intervene and put them back on their heads and there's a single shot where she's in frame with the uh, footmen and they're just sort of like clay puppets that are sitting there in a single pose. Right. But it's like one will open his mouth and then will be treated to a horrifying shot of this real meat tongue. And then it'll like <laughs> curl back in. <laughs> oh, and it has such a wonderful sound to it when he's hopping around grabbing flies. Mm-hmm. Like. <laughs> yeah. Everything in this movie sounds wet. <laughs> That's the young slunk me a touch. We also get the classic Mad Tea Party with the Mad Hatter and what's the name of the hair? The March Hare. The March Hare, that's right, yeah. It's like the Mad Hatter's like a Don Quixote looking doll. He's like a marionette, yeah. Yeah, he's, well, he's an automaton. He's like an old school, like a ventriloquist dummy. Like uh, if you watch the movie uh, Hugo, he looks like the thing in, in prominently featured in that. Yeah, and there are shots when he drinks his tea, the camera goes behind to zoom in on his back and show the tea just sort of dribbling down the hollow in his back. Oh, man. I think he was my individual favorite puppet in this. And then the March Hare is constantly, like, buttering up watches and hanging them on pegs on the uh, Mad Hatter. And every so often he powers down and his eye, like, pops out on a string and the Mad Hatter has to reach over and wind him back up again. Man, the butter in the clock was another thing that I'm like, you know what? This is in the book. (laughs) It's like, as bizarre as this is, it's authentic. It's right. I remember Ed Wynn doing it. Although um, the Dormouse is considerably more bizarre than I would argue anything else in here. Because what kind of animal was it here? It looks like a ferret or some kind of related animal. Yeah, that's what I thought. It was like, it's like a mink stole that comes crawling out of the cup and then goes back in. Just like keeps getting longer and longer oh it it crawls out and like spends like a minute licking out all the the plates and teacups since they're doing the thing where they're constantly changing places for clean cups like they run out of clean cups and the mink store mouse comes out just like (laughs) like a minute man i i read the book after i watched the movie and i didn't even place that thing as the door mouse that's crazy (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the mad tea party scene i think is also worth talking about for just a minute because it's really exemplifies how swan Kamir has stripped out a lot of lewis carroll's playful wordplay in order to get it down to just the barest essentials because it turns into this really tight loop of just like the mad hatter and the march hare saying a small number of things that they say in the book like you know the whole why is a raven like a writing desk your hair needs cutting I want a clean cup. Let's all change places. 
And as the scene goes on, the amount of time in that loop gets shorter and shorter until at the end, it's just sort of all the stuff one after another, after another, after another, in this tiny little loop of madness. It's almost like one of those things. I don't even know what they're called. Like kind of like a wind up toy or something where I'm thinking of it's, it's spoofed in Shrek when they do the little, uh, it's a small world song. Like the things kind of, I guess it's just animatronic or whatever, but like the way that it kind of mechanically does it in a loop, it, it it's not like alive. It's like, it's just kind of repeating over and over again, you know? Yeah, it's, which gets back to what I was saying about this not being so much like a living, you know, vibrant wonderland like you have over in England, but sort of like a child of you know, deprivation and lack, who's just taking these very small number of strange things from around her house and and arranging them into something like Alice. Well, so I noted I had a list of four kind of unifying themes that I saw in this movie. And I think the clash of that mechanical synthetic stuff with the organic, you know, meats and tongues and jellies and foods like the the clashing of those things seems very intentional. And I think that's where you get some of like the visceral discomfort. It's like when there's tax, steel tax in food and stuff. Like that one scene where she picks up a loaf of bread and all of a sudden it sprouts nails from all over it again. Exactly. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That type of stuff. So one thing that just stuck out to me i keep saying stuck out or struck me and it it sounds like i'm repeating myself because so much of this movie is just like whoa oh interjections it's like exclamation points for every reaction in this in this movie but one that really got me was the white rabbit every time she runs into him and he checks his pocket watch he's got to rip it out of himself because he's got it inside in the stuffing and every time he pulls the clock out a little stuffing pours out Oh, and that one time when he tries to actually fix it and all he does is just get a safety pin and put that into his his chest and it doesn't even do anything to close the hole at all. Right, but what that conveys to me is mortality. Mm. Because, I mean, his his guts are pouring out, but what is he doing? He's checking the clock. So time is passing and he's getting older and he's decaying. Hmm. Maybe this is just a, a midlife crisis read, but it's like, wow. Every time he checks the clock, a little bit more of himself is gone. Well, he is late for a very important date. Interesting. Right. I never thought of that as a death reference, but I can. it's like, why did the chicken cross the road? Like, as soon as you realize that it might be about death, it's kind of hard to see it any other way. Yeah. Also, he doesn't do it every time, but since you, he's licking the sawdust off of his pocket watch every so often, and since you characterize the sawdust as being his guts, that's a delightful image now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he eats it by the bowl, but I I mean I guess it makes sense if you know they say you are what you eat. So <laughs> he's gotta he's gotta fill himself back up if it's always coming out. So Well here's the thing, if if it is a death reference, if he's a taxidermy bunny and he's eating sawdust to keep himself full, ain't he already dead? But that kind of t- so I had my my four themes. One of them was the clash of the organic and the synthetic, and then kind of somewhat similarly or analogously like I, I too saw a lot of life versus death imagery in here. I mean, to me, the, the obvious one is you see like lots of animal skeletons battling Alice. And then later, and then now and then you see real live animals too. And then you have the taxidermied rabbit that kind of kicks everything off. And then, I don't know, it's just like these blatant clash of these things that are very much alive and then also very visibly dead just as a recurring thing. I I like what Brian said about how the clock and like the rabbit eating his guts to try and stay alive a little bit longer, or at least like stay stuffed a little bit longer was, was, is clever and counting down his time on his watch. Yeah. One thing I note that you put in the uh, notes that I think is a noteworthy note, 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 note is that you put down that the uh, Cheshire Cat is not in this movie, which has always been pretty core to uh, my understanding of the film. And what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, here's the thing. The movie does leave out a few other things from the book. You know, there's no caucus race and the uh, griffin and the, mo- and the uh, mock turtle. Yeah, no mock turtle. Yeah. Although, you know, everyone leaves out the mock turtle, which they shouldn't, but they do. By the way, the Cheshire Cat is probably the only character in the book who is, like 
invested in any way in helping Alice, who actually sort of does. Like he gives her directions and she follows them and she winds up round about where he says she should go. Even if he is still about as weird and chaotic as everything else in Wonderland, he is to a degree a helpful character and a friendly face. And I think his absence here couples with the fact that accepting about two scenes, the one where she goes out on the rocky plain to go down the rabbit hole and the brief bit where she's washed outside and winds up on another creek bed in her doll form, the thing is entirely set within this house. I think that sort of exclusive interiority and the fact that the Cheshire cat is just completely absent, not even in any sort of hint do we get to his character, no small portion at all. It shows that this is a movie that's less about someone who's come up in like a well-socialized, properly managed society and more someone who's been sort of like isolated, hasn't had much, has sort of only really known what's in this house for the longest time and is just seeing these strange faces and appearances and happenings coming out from her imagination. What do you think on that? So do you read this as the product of a, a mind that's developed in isolation? A mind that's maybe not developed in isolation, but a mind that has developed with less. You know, I, I did sort of write on this film for a school assignment when I was in college, and I did kind of zero in on the fact that this was right before the Velvet Revolution that brought uh, Czechoslovakia at the time out from under the uh, Soviet influence. So that story colored my read. I do think there's an air of entrapment where every, the you always feel kind of contained and now everything is just like a closed box, slightly remixed and decayed and brought to life in different formats. And it doesn't feel like expa- like an expansive wandering journey the way that at least the Disney adaptation kind of does, you know, where you're kind of strolling along. And like we say, it's all just, you know, rooms in this house. What it made me feel like was an I Spy book where everything is made out of these like old fashioned school supplies, all in different arrangements. Interesting. And, you know, everything you see, like maybe it forms some big, interesting creative image, but you're like looking closely at everything to see what it's made out of at its component level. I wonder if you can make an I Spy book out of a frames from this movie. You probably could, yeah. I spy with my little eye something a child should absolutely not be around. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Uh, I, I want to just talk a little bit about the environment that this child actor was in. <laughs> it's like, so, well, it made me think that the, the Alice in the book is not in a very safe situation. But then, like, this physical human girl especially, like, she's getting... She's got all these skeletons and tacks all over her, but then there's a scene where they're just, like, straight up throwing books and pans at her. (laughs) Yeah, it's like bouncing them off her. The part that has always made me most uncomfortable is when she initially goes down the rabbit hole. She pokes her finger into the drawer and she comes out because she pricked it on something and there's a brief shot of it bleeding and her sucking the blood off. And then she just kind of gets in and there's all these, like, you know, the, like I said, protractors and the compass she poked herself on, but she's just like crawling over those p- pieces of like sort of slightly jagged, slightly rusty metal in a few shots. And that always makes me just shudder a little bit. Yeah. So another kind of recurring image that we get, we see it at least twice before it kind of becomes center stage, is this painted series of like, wall patterns or something that look like kind of an outdoor Victorian garden and they're kind of tiered. So it's like, uh, you know, you could walk between two of them and this ends up being one of the settings of the croquet game the with the queen or the duchess. I forget which one it is. Is it the queen that she does croquet with? The queen of hearts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And This was a pretty interesting set, kind of different from everything else we saw. And when she actually goes there, we get some weird effects. Like she walks left through one and kind of loops back from the right. But she's grown in size as she comes back from the right. Hmm. The weird effect that I noted is that like once she's in the Queen of Hearts domain, all of the uh, 
characters who are native to that place are cutouts of um, characters who are on playing cards. And there's one part where there are two um, there are two men do- in a sword fight, and whenever they turn around, they put their backs to the camera, so you see the blank side of the playing cards. The cards they were cut out from in the background also turn around to face the camera. Yeah, the this whole segment where everything is made out of paper and card stock and stuff, it's a pretty abrupt shift from the the kind of visual experience of everything that preceded it, but it's it's also pretty cool. Yeah, it it felt more conventional to me. It was like, oh, well, what are we going to make the card people out of? Oh, how about cards? <laughs> Let's do cards, guys. <laughs> I do think it is fitting because the card tableau that you pointed out that sort of stands in for the garden that Alice sees through the tiny door and spends the entire story trying to reach. So it being something that's markedly different than this sort of dirty and slightly dilapidated house full of these strange, uncomfortable things, it makes sense that it'd be somewhere that she'd want to be going to. It's at least something different, slightly more inviting. Yeah, it's like the the vision of a beautiful escape from this house, but not an actual escape. It's like it's an escape imagined by a child who's only ever seen like illustrations of places to escape to. Mm-hmm. Or like just imagine going to places depicted on playing cards. The one thing that has me hesitating from this reading that like she's a product of someone who's been like, living a super sheltered life as we open seeing her like out in the wild with her sister, like in the, the Creek. And that is very clearly like an open wilderness. True. But I I just take it as like a means of establishing this as being like Alice. Like it it is in the familiar mode for a very brief instant. And then we are all, but completely subsumed in a spunk mirrors vision for this. Right. His nightmare box house. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) By the way, this is uh, one of the very few adaptations where the Queen of Hearts constant cry for off with their head actually uh, comes to something. Very frequently, too, and on camera. Lots of decapitations, but it's mostly cards. And not only cards, though. Other things get decapitated. Oh, yeah, she decapitates the uh, Mad Hatter and the March Hare when they show up. But they fix it by just swapping heads. Yeah. So that that's theme number three out of four for me is lots of head stuff going on in this movie. I don't know what it is with heads. They're swapping. They're getting knocked off and put back on. There's skeleton heads on things they shouldn't be on. I don't know what's up. We are kind of already talked about it, but I guess Svjankmeyer, however you say it, he's got a, a head thing going on where that's like a viscerally fascinating image for him. It's, it's not just this movie. It's something I noticed across all of his films is that he is a very attentive director to the modes of perception like he likes getting in real close on these various strange objects he's assembled to create his animation so you get a you know super close-up look at the textures like i've noted he likes enhancing the tiny little things in the soundscape so that they're loud and right in your ear he's he's got this way of shooting strangely textured objects that make, gives his films a very tactile feel. Like you could very much reach into the screen and touch them and feel how they're all, you know, leathery or gooey or crinkly or sharp or whatever it is that he's showing. You get that sense right on your skin. There's even a few places where I'd say you could even, you know, smell what he's filming. And a lot of that stuff does come down to, being based in the head either you know with the sensory organs or the brain so shout out to an interesting wikipedia article are you guys familiar with the cortical homunculus oh yes i was actually exposed to that in one of my first days in uh psychology in college yeah yeah that's where you tend to run into it no i've never heard of this okay so it's a it's a representation of the human body but with the parts proportional to the amount of the brain dedicated to those body systems. So like anything that's got a lot of like sensory, uh, like nerve endings and things, things that set off uh, signals in your brain are way bigger on this thing. Oh, so like huge hands and eyes and stuff. It's got huge hands and like an enormous lolling tongue. And then of course the genitalia very large but just like little tiny torso, really freakish. <laughs> and when you said, 
Well, what was it that you just said? Something about the, the different areas of the brain and uh, the, the senses. How, how most of our sensory organs are concentrated in our, in our head, or if you really want to get interior to the head theme, it's like everything's contained inside the skull. So, Right, there you go. So just these things, these body parts that are very sensory being overemphasized. And I think you get some of that here. Yeah, fun little not safe for work factoid about that. Uh, given the way that all the um, places, the, given the way your brain arranges the uh, placement of the, of the areas that are meant to process that sensory information, since the feet and the genitals are right next to each other, there have been instances of people who've had like their feet or legs amputated experiencing a weird form of phantom limb syndrome where they, because their brain has just sort of generalized to expand out the nearest area to this place that's not being used anymore they wind up getting orgasms feelings where their feet used to be that is very weird the brain's a fun thing i suppose it's fun yeah it's squishy <laughs> uh we sh we should say how the the movie ends of course so at the end of the trial she's gorging on these little cracker co cookie things biscuits a trial where she's being more led by the nose than usual. Like they've got a script that they expect her to follow where she's supposed to confess to having stolen the tarts and then ask for the harshest punishment and it's the queen of hearts. We don't know what that is. I think I should also note that like, it's especially unpleasant with the decapitations because once the white rabbit reaches the queen, he's got these enormous pair of scissors and he walks around like slacking them together with this very sharp and uncomfortable sound. So, you know, it may only be, you know, cutouts and dolls getting their heads cut off, but, you know, still kind of sounds very uncomfortable and unpleasant, I say, about getting your head cut off. <laughs> one would think. I've never had my head cut off. Maybe it feels nice. You're lighter for one. Yeah, that's true. You don't have that big old uh, heavy thing weighing you down up there, but <laughs> with the scissors coming towards her, she like starts shaking her head like in fear. And her head transforms between different characters we've seen throughout the, the adventure. More head stuff. Head stuff. Which one? Which one? Which one? And then she kind of wakes up on the floor where we initially saw her saw her taxidermied rabbit come to life in her, her room. And she looks around and it looks exactly as it did before things started getting screwy. Except the taxidermied rabbit is still not there. She goes and she reaches in where the rabbit was and there's like this little drawer where the rabbit's suit was and she pulls it out and there's scissors there. And and what's what's the closing line? I think it. Oh, here, I wrote it down. She says, he's late as usual. I think I'll cut his head off. So there's also a shot where uh, she kind of pauses in a cutout card and she herself is basically taking the form of a the Queen of Hearts. That's like a little bit before, obviously, she wakes up. But I always like this idea. It's always fascinated me that, like, is there a mirror between Alice and the Queen of Hearts? Is there anything to that? I've never found enough sense to actually make that connection. But this, I thought of that connection in my head again is like, I don't know, something about, like, the absurdity of growing up and, like, wanting to destroy everything around you is, like, an impulse as the world makes less sense. The Queen of Hearts is sort of the ultimate child's vision of an authoritarian, someone who's all full of bluster and will always have it her way. Your way always are my way. You know, that sort of thing. So, and considering that the movie does end with Alice evoking the Queen's famous line, I think there is something to it here, just sort of like, you know, Perhaps something about the journey resulted in her being a little more like the queen, or maybe she's just, you know, continuing on as she always has. Something interior to her being expressed a little more openly than it was before. You should read the sequel, Dan. Yeah, I probably should. You got to read through the looking glass. There's a lot more king and queen stuff in there, but in, in that one, instead of playing cards, it's all about chess. Like the whole story takes place on a chess board. Okay, maybe I'll read it, yeah. Yeah, it's always it's always funny to me that people kind of mix up traits between the Queen of Hearts and the Red Queen from that book. 
Yeah, I mean, the the Disney version especially just considers them pretty much as one book. Just kind of bleeds everything together. Yeah. With more, with more from the first one, but... Like, the, I think the walrus and the carpenter from that second one, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, definitely. Yeah. There was supposed to be a song and a segment dedicated to the Jabberwock that got cut out in the movie's radical reworking that happened during development. Oh, uh, interesting. Wait, in the Disney one or in this one? In the, in the Disney one. Oh, okay. I was like, how would that possibly fit in here, a song? <laughs> yeah, there's no songs in this movie. Not much, not much music, either. Yeah. I kind of like that. It's... Uh... Very, it's very striking in its selective use of sound. Makes the sound effects pop a little bit more. Like I say, that's common across pretty much all of Sonic Mia's filmography. And it's especially notable in uh, Conspirators of Pleasure, which is all about uh, fetishization. Hmm. Yeah. I feel like I gotta, I gotta watch more of this guy at some point. Definitely. But that's how Alice from 1988, Nekozi Alanki, ends with Alice with the scissors muttering about cutting the rabbit's head off. But my fourth theme, which I didn't get around to, and I thought this was going to be the defining theme of the the movie at the start, because what happens is she goes into, reaches into the drawer and out comes a bloody finger. I was like, oh, this is going to be all about how freaky it is when your body starts changing and you have to start thinking about sex and stuff. That's what this whole interpretation is going to be about. But no, Dan, that was last week. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. When we talked about uh, the 13th year, the Disney channel movie, but that ended up being not a very clean read as a generalized theme. There are moments with it, but it's definitely not like that singular a focus as I was expecting it to be in the first five minutes. I don't know what you're talking about. We've all gone to the part of puberty where we have to emerge from the horrifying doll cocoon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about the movie having like a sexual dimension to it. There are parts where I can definitely see it, like you say, with the uh, the living tube socks. But as with the accusations towards uh, like Alice in Wonderland as an expression of Lewis Carroll's pedophilia, I don't think it's a very major thing here. And just something that's sort of there to... If anything, if you want to say it was a conscious thing on Spunk Mayor's part, just sort of add to that element of discomfort that's running throughout. Right. But it's like a third or fourth tier priority compared to, you know, the meat and the sound and the goop. Yeah, very visceral. Well, let's talk some things that we might not have hit yet, things we liked, things we didn't like, and then we can maybe kind of start wrapping our thoughts up. So... Brian Gargas, what are some things about Alice that we haven't talked about yet that you really liked? Well, we did sort of leave out my favorite scene entirely. Well, share with us your favorite scene, Gargas. We skipped right past the uh, pool of tears. That's right, yeah. Yeah, which here, it's sort of like Alice, you know, as in the book, gets frustrated. Nothing verbal, because... Alice and the characters in Wonderland do not speak at all unless they absolutely have to. Like she just sort of sits down and starts crying and there's a lot of water running down her face and down her dress and, you know, across a few shots, all of a sudden the entire room is flooded. And I can't remember if there's anything like this in the book. You may be able to remind me, but the mouse comes along swimming through the water with a trunk attached to his tail. And he climbs up onto Alice's head, opens up his trunk, and starts building a little fire that he slings a pot over, uses her hair as kindling, and starts cooking himself up some soup. Yeah, I I did not recognize it, so I don't think it was in the first one. But that one was really wild. I was like, man, is this going to like eventually dismember Alice herself or something? Because that... That's like one of the closer encounters to actual violence she gets when they're like setting her hair on fire. Yeah, because he starts hammering these like stakes into her head. Right. Uh, And I don't know. I wanted her to stand up for herself. She does eventually dunk him in the water. But like like when she's getting the the pans and things thrown at her later in the movie, I, I wanted her to like smash some stuff. It's like you're bigger than these things. Just like kick them down. They They need to stop messing with you this way. She got the power. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always think it's interesting whenever, like, characters in Wonderland don't entirely regard Alice as human. Like, the bird who thinks she's a serpent got cut out from this, but that's always been one of the more memorable passages to me from the book. 
Although they, we do get a little something of that scene when she's munching on the mush on the on the wooden mushroom, and instead of like turning back and forth from her doll self, it's like some trees in the room keep going from like these full grown trees to just these stumpy little shrubs. So you know something of that experimental part is still in here. You know when she's chewing on the mushroom, trying to find the exact right size. Yeah. I, I do not want to know how Spunk Mir may have uh, adapted the part where her neck grows really long so the bird mistakes her for a serpent, though. That would probably be very horrifying. Oh, yeah, God. I can't imagine. <laughs> Maybe with one of the dolls or something. Because the doll does have, like, a weirdly long neck, I thought. But yeah. I don't know. It was, like, prominent teeth. You notice that? Yeah. The, it was a weird-looking doll to spend so much time with. I think, in general, old dolls look weird. I don't know. I feel like whenever I see old dolls, I'm always like, that looks like, it's kind of like clowns, you know, the, the general shape of classic dolls have kind of been supplanted in our brain as uncanny horror things when they used to be a thing of joy and comfort and amusement, the same way that clowns have become essentially centrally horrifying things and nothing else in pop culture. It at least matches very well to the uh, actress's tendency to put on a like detached but also mildly horrified look whenever we have to look at the doll in close up, though. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of how Swankmir adapted the Pool of Tears here. It's probably the single most memorable image of the movie to me. Just Alice there, neck deep in water, with a little mouse pounding away and lighting a fire on her head. Right. And I think there's like a floating dish of biscuits or something like that, too, that come to her. Yeah, which is how she turns back into the doll and then gets washed outside. Right. W what about you, Dan? Did you have a favorite moment that stuck out with you? The whole segment with the, the living socks eating through the floor and then like the caterpillar, that's the teeth. And then immediately after that, we get like she goes into the kitchen and with all these things alive, including the slab of meat. And the fish hopping around with his lolling tongue coming out were for me like seven minutes that were the most striking to me. Yeah. So I remember back when we discussed 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, I said, this is the kind of movie where you can just say there is a human lighthouse and listeners just have to imagine what that is. Well, <laughs> this movie takes that to 11 everywhere all the time. Just... I don't know if you can picture the things that we're talking about, but trust that they're in there and you just got to toss this thing on and, and look if you dare. Right. It's a very visual film above all else, for sure. There's images everywhere. Very visual film, very sticky film, very sharp film. But for me, uh, if I were to single out one image, it, it might be towards the beginning when they are suddenly in that wasteland. Like they had been in the house and then they're just in this barren jumble of like driftwood and stones and they have to scramble across it. Alice after the rabbit was really memorable. It's like the room just kind of extended out into like desolate wasteland. It's pretty wild. What it reminded me of was in Monty Python and the Holy Grail, how like there's at least one, I think several times where there's like a castle and Lancelot runs up from really far away and it just like takes way too long for him to get there. Oh, I love that. And he's just running, running, running. And like multiple times it cuts back and forth between the castle and him out there, just like tearing across the wastes. And it just takes him forever, and then suddenly, abruptly, he's there. Or like the Simpsons episode with Johnny Cash as the coyote, and all of a sudden, like, it's the desert sprawls out miles and miles. Oh, yeah. Is that Johnny Cash who voices the coyote? Yes. That's right. I think it also helps that, like, for a few, for a few of those perspective shots, they've got the camera slung real low to the ground, and they're just running all herky-jerky towards the desk with it like that. Mm-hmm. Gargus, were there any other kind of like overarching things or specific things that we might have missed that were were highlights for you? Uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I'm scrubbing through a copy of the movie right now just to be certain. I do want to note that the White Rabbit's house is like made out of playing blocks. That's a neat little thing. And also always fun when they're like doing the stop motion on and have to avoid knocking anything over because, you know, it's not stuck together. It's just sort of loosely stacked blocks. 
let, let's talk some some not so good things. So my kind of one not so good thing for the movie is kind of an overarching thing that relates to my previous remarks about Alice in Wonderland in general, which is that it's very episodic in a way that doesn't like intuitively build on the things that have already happened. And this is just such a visually rich film that I found it kind of exhausting by even it's a short movie. It's like 84 minutes or something like that. And even by like the 60 minute mark, I was like, I feel like I need to take a break before I can finish this movie because it's just been so much thrown at you that it doesn't all, it's like snippets that are just each inventions in and of themselves that kind of require you to grapple with them. And, and that again, it was kind of, kind of exhausting and kind of draining to, to watch, but I, I still don't quite click with the, Alice's adventures in Wonderland story overall, but this version of it where it's like kind of not quite so uh, whimsy, chaos, anarchy, but is like a more subdued version of that really worked for me and engaged me more than say the, the Disney version did. And that might be the most notable other adaptation I've seen. I haven't seen too many of them, probably a couple others, but they're not coming to mind, but yeah. The good uh, Disney adaptation, not the bad Disney adaptation. Of course, the very first Disney project was an adaptation of Alice in Wonderland, combining live action and animation in like 1925. Whoa, really? Yep. Yeah, the Alice comedies, which weren't strictly an adaptation of Alice. Right, but it was just like the idea that it's a real girl in... In this fantasy land. Cartoon situations, yeah. Yeah, that was the first thing he ever worked on. Brian, what about you? Any not so good things? I didn't love all the repetition that we get. I got tired of the drawer thing. It's like, oh, it's another drawer. <laughs> I wonder what's going to happen with this one. Dum. Pop. Yep. Okay. You know, for a movie that's so unpredictable in other areas, it's like we, we get a lot of the same things happening over and over. Yeah, I think that's just part of us. Funk me a sense of humor, though. Yeah, I kind of like that. It was it was like a kind of goofy uh, juxtaposition, as you said, where you get the stuff that you just don't even know whatever the hell is going to happen, and then you can just keep coming back to the goddamn drawer over and over again. I, I saw something darkly comic about it too. What about you, Gargus? What what were some things that don't any things here that that don't quite do it for you? If there is one thing that I were to say negatively against the movie, it's that like. It's not always clear exactly how safe the child actress is in these sets. Not like, you know, in terms of, you know, abuse from adults on set, but just sort of like, should we be putting her here? Are there laws? (laughs) Is it okay for a child to be around this much rust and sawdust all day? (laughs) Yeah, it's a legitimate question, as Brian pointed out. It's it is unnerving to see a child in these like a, a real human child in these very unsettling and off putting images that are not quite body horror, but are almost body horror. Yeah. I mean, it should be noted that a lot of the time she's not like on the same set as a lot of this stuff. There's there's very few instances where they use pixelation animation in order to do her stop motion alongside the rest of the stuff. So some of the more extreme stuff I doubt she was present for, but it, it, you know, even then you still just have, like I mentioned, the scene where she's crawling through the rabbit hole and there's all this stuff that looks really sharp underneath her bare arms and legs. Right. It, it doesn't like damage the movie much for me, but if you were to push me to say a negative word against it, it would just sort of be like, and eh, this makes me feel the same sort of a tingly, uncomfortable sensation, but towards something I'd rather not be happening. Like for real. Oh, and also... No mock turtle, that's always the greatest sin against Alice adaptations. <laughs> Brian, any other things you wanted to toss out there as not so good things, or are you ready to jump to the rating? Not yeah, not really. I'm I think I'm ready to toss a rating on this thing. Alright, so we have come to the signature section of the goods, which is Is It Good? Where we will each give the movie a rating on our eight point goodness scale, ranging from very not good which is a one out of eight to our masterpiece rating tour day. Good an eight out of eight. So Brian is Alice Neko Z Alenke from, I'm sure I say that wrong every single time from 1988 by Jan Svjankmeyer. 
Good. It's okay, Dan. We exist in isolation. None of us, none of us speaks Czech, so <laughs> whatever we come up with is just going to be the consensus. Uh, for me, I'm going to put this one at a six out of eight. Very good. And I waffled a lot. Just, I'll say I've never seen a movie quite like this. And uh, as in some of our past selections, I've I've said that if a movie is really, really strange, it's hard for me to rate because I try, or maybe I flatter myself, but I try to give an objective ruling in as much as would I recommend any one of our featured films to somebody on the street. Just, oh, hey, you should check out Nico Zialanki. In this case, if you got a strong stomach, I'd say, yeah, you should. Because it's going to stick with you. It's memorable. I, I think I have a lot of respect for somebody who does stop motion, whatever the medium. And, wow. Like, a lot of work must have gone into this. And I think with mixed results, but... Wow. That's what I kept saying to myself is, wow. <laughs> Each new thing, just like a pop, a shock, a jolt when I witnessed each new scene. And that is Alice to me. What about you, Gargus? All right. So one of these days I'm going to bring on the movie that I'm not going to be giving an automatic eight to. But I take it today is not that day. Yeah, Neko Wait for the movie is an easily 8 out of 8 toward a good movie. I mean, let's put it this way. I am a very easy lay for stop motion animation. I am easily swayed to the side of any movie that puts a very heavy emphasis on the unconventional sensory experience. I really love pretty much any adaptation of Alice I watch. And to me, this one is both considered in its observations and very meticulous in its execution that is so very um Jan Svankmir. It's like I say, I don't know if it's his absolute best work, but it is embodies the things you can expect out of him to such a strong degree that it's easily one of my favorites from him and probably one of my all-time favorites. And I'd argue that pretty much all of the imagery in the movie is of an equal power to the original John Tenniel illustrations. And sort of as we've seen through our conversation here, the ways that you can interpret the movie and say, well, what is Svankmir doing here are not only comparable to the open-ended interpretability of the original book, but probably maybe even not surpass it, but come close enough to it that you can easily like pick at this movie and come away with your own interpretation and be able to textually support it however you like to do it. So... You know, one of my favorites, easy eight out of eight. If uh, Brian has a lot of trouble rating movies that are strange, then I'll just have to get even stranger next time I come on. <laughs> there we go. We we do like us some weird stuff, but like Brian said, it can be it can be hard to to process in the overall cinematic canon of what the goods discusses. Oh, what's the good of reviewing the canon if you can't struggle a little to define how things fit into it? That's what I say when I pick things like It's Potty Time to go up alongside uh, Suspiria and Best Picture winners. Right. Well, that's the only way to watch movies. Of course. So for me, I had a lot of cognitive dissonance in this rating the way that I have on some of our other unusual ones. Most recently, Robot, the Indian film. Uh, of course, House is maybe the closest comparison just in like every scene is a feast even if we don't need 17 consecutive feasts every scene is a feast in some way and so i had a lot of things i really loved i mean it's just it's, i love it when a movie is as unique as this one it does something in such a strong way but also really kind of having its own voice and and just i don't know it's really its own thing fully realized you can tell he wanted to do exactly what he did and he had a very clear idea of it and never wavered on it even as he added in all these wild components and parts to it very fresh probably my favorite version of alice i've ever seen which again is not comprehensive but i like this overall tone that's just like on the very edge of your seat uncomfortable to look at and experience it's like a viscerally unnerving experience more so than just wacky chaos 
That said, I lost steam with it in the last 20 minutes. Like looking back, I don't even think it was actually that long, but it felt like the kind of repeating tea scene went over and over again, the mad tea. And then I thought that the the cards, the the paper look of the cards just was kind of a slightly deflating way to go out on the movie because it wasn't quite as viscerally intense as other portions of the film. Still cool. I still liked it. Uh, not quite a not so good thing, but just not the strongest part. And I don't know, it all adds up to something that is one that I'll remember and one that I might like more on future visits. But like Brian, I'm going to end up on a six. I'm going to end up on a very good on this because I really do think it's in some ways a masterpiece and in some ways it's like almost a chore to watch. Maybe, maybe that's a little putting it too harshly, but it's it is a taxing thing to watch in numerous ways. And so I, I can't quite decide where to come down on it in that regard. I don't think I would recommend it for all audiences, but for anyone, like Brian said, with a strong stomach and anyone who is just looking for, for something like they've never seen before that's very well designed and composed with a very strong voice, man, you're, you're going to have a, a lot to look at and a lot to think about with, with this movie. It is, I'll agree, a movie that asks a lot from the audience in terms of attentiveness and willingness to sit through some disturbing imagery. But I think it's one that pays you richly if you're willing to give it that. And I'll point out uh, Gargus has a pretty long essay that they, they wrote on the on your letterboxed Gargus. And I, I read the first few paragraphs of it. And I think after we talk, I'm going to go catch up and read the whole thing. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, do warning, like I say at the top of that essay, it is just a repost of something that I wrote in college for a school assignment that I just posted because I watched this a few years ago on my birthday and wanted to log something and put that out publicly. So I also reread that today. It's not my best piece of writing, but if you're happy with it, then I'm happy with that. Yeah. And now before we wrap, Gargus, anything you want to pitch, anything you want to... Uh our audience to go seek out? Well, uh, as with last time, I should note that I am on Medium under the name Gargus SCP. I'm continuing my um, series, Registering the Registry, looking over the films inducted into the National Film Registry. I'm about halfway through the uh, 2021 class right now. So I got, you know, The Murder of Fred Hampton, Pink Flamingos, Sounder, The Long Goodbye, Return of the Jedi. A lot of good stuff coming up on that. I've also started a... Uh, Patreon with a few tiers on it with some extra related stuff to registering the registry, looking at films I think should be in it and looking back at stuff that I don't have time for. So I'm just on there. Patreon at Gargus, I believe. I should have like the things that I actually, you know, use to put my work out there and maybe make money in my head, but I don't. <laughs> no, patreon.com forward slash Gargus. Yeah. I, I want to encourage people to go check out uh, Gargus's series on the registry, which are always extremely in-depth and informative. And you just posted one a couple of days ago that I got a little bit way into, which is a rare film about something that happened during the civil rights movement, which I'm, I'm learning about. So I, I'm appreciating that. Just lots of good stuff. Yeah, the uh, Chicano Moratorium from 1970. And it would also help if you checked out the Patreon, because believe it or not, writing those sorts of in-depth looks at films takes a lot of time, and it'd be nice if I could have some money to compensate with it. Good content should win. That's what we believe on the goods. Yes, and last thing, not anything that I do, but I would like to say if you want a really weird version of Alice, I highly recommend the 1980s 2 short from Vince Collins, Malice in Wonderland. Hmm. Hmm. I have to look that up, too. It is... Fucking trippy. <laughs> wow. And uh, I guess one thing to say for the 1999 version, it's got a mock turtle in it. Oh, yes, I was just looking at that. Gene Wilder plays him. Oh, wow. So I think that brings us to the wrap. You know, Gargus, a delight. Absolutely always, every time. Maybe we can make it happen again sometime in the future. Thank you for coming. Yep. And if it does, I will come here with a film so weird it will hurt you. <laughs> That sounds like a threat. Oh, no, it is a threat. <laughs> so I'm now going to share what we'll be discussing next week. And I don't know, Brian, whether this is something that'll make you happy or something that will 
make you salty, but I'm going to steal something that I know that you've been considering picking at some point because I've been wanting to watch it. Okay. And that is the 2012 adaptation of the Lorax, the, the Dr. Seuss film. And I'm going to ask Brian and myself to prepare a thematically related top five. And that is our top five songs in movies. And I think when we discuss it, it'll become clear. Oof. Uh, Just in in movies overall? Songs in movies? Top five? This is, this is big. This is a huge sweeping ask. Well, hold on. So here's why. It's because last time we talked about Pixar, you noted that we had almost identical lists and that was, it was a very closed set. And so I thought I'm going to go the opposite for our next top five. It's going to be such an open world that there's almost no way we will overlap. You know, it's a top five Think The ones that are closest to your heart, you shouldn't have to search too far to find the ones that are closest to your heart. So top five of your favorites of songs and movies and, and the stipulations I'm putting on this, and we can talk more about it uh, throughout the week. And then we'll, d- list the official criteria in the next episode, but I'm thinking not credits songs, not scores songs that are appear in movies that are sung. I guess it doesn't have to be sung. If you find something that fits the bill, like the end of La La Land, I suppose. And also preferably either original to that movie or popularized and kind of exemplified by that movie. Okay. So you know, they don't have to be from musicals. I can tell you the list that I've kind of started to cobble together in my head. Some are from musicals, some are, are, are not. All right. So like, for instance, you could do uh, I Will Always Love You from The Bodyguard, even though it originated in Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. Well, so does she actually sing that in the movie? I haven't seen it. I know that it's associated with that movie. Or was that a credit song? I think. I'm not sure. I, I don't actually know. I just like to reference the other film when i can that's that's good but uh no that's uh this is a good challenge i'm excited for this one and if nothing else we'll get to talk seuss again so you know i'm always down for that well i won't be here next week but i do have two edicts for you regarding lorax one since you are talking songs in movies and i can understand why you're doing it i recommend you look up the demo song for the lorax biggering because i think it's better than anything that actually made it into the movie I was going to mention that it's on your list of bangers. You sent me your list of your favorite songs ever called Bangers, and I noticed that that was on there. Yes, I do a mean version of it. (laughs) And two, if you two do not make at least some mention of the strange Tumblr once with fandom while discussing the movie, I won't come back next time. Oh, yeah, there's going to be some one sass talk. (laughs) Good. I don't even know what this is in reference. Okay, this will be fun because I'm going to be the host, but Brian knows a lot more about this movie than I do. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see where this goes. All right. Well, as always, uh, thank you, Brian. And Gargas, special thanks to you for joining us. This has been a, a, a fun episode, something totally different. But then again, different is good. And we are the goods. And uh, listeners, thank you for joining us. Have a good week, everyone. Ciao. I hope you join us again. Thank you.